Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here. So today we're going to talk about some common misconceptions and outright delusions that people have of their capabilities when it comes to preparing for crisis scenarios. Let's get to it. Now at some point or another in my life I've held all of the following survivalist delusions. I've since matured in my perspective and I hope this video will compel you to do the same. The reality is, you're not going to learn survival skills on the fly. Motor skills are something that need to be honed after hundreds of trial and error runs in the best of conditions. People train in optimal conditions with increasing technical difficulty so that they can perform various tasks in less optimal conditions. Learning new skills like how to make a friction fire with a bow drill, even when you have a full stomach, a clear head, you're well rested, these things are very challenging to learn. It's going to be 10 times harder to learn in a crisis situation. This is not to say it's impossible to follow the instructions of a well-defined survival manual within one of these crisis scenarios, but you're likely not going to have the energy and the mental resilience to do so. You want to have those motor skills fine-tuned beforehand. Leave nothing to chance and practice all of your survival skills. Practice makes perfect. Some people are prepared for the apocalypse, but they're not prepared to change a tire on their car should they get a flat. A channel here on YouTube called Prepared Mind 101 hosted by Chris Tanner coined the 95-5 principle. This principle reflects the tendency of some preppers and survivalists to put 95% of their focus into things that are only 5% likely to happen. For example, a well-rounded prepper would have a contingency plan for something like an electromagnetic pulse, but they may not have a first aid kit in their car, or a glass breaking tool, or a fire extinguisher, things which you're far more likely to need. So don't let prepping for the big stuff overshadow prepping for the small stuff. The truth is, unfortunately, most preppers that I've met are not going to be able to carry their backpack for prolonged periods of time. Many preppers and survivalists I know have very adequate, well thought out, fully stocked bug out bags, but very few have the physical fitness necessary to transport this gear in suboptimal conditions. The tragic reality is, and the reason why I always stress the importance of physical fitness on this channel, is that most people are not going to be able to transport their 35 plus pound bug out bag on perfectly flat paved roads with no impediments, never mind the conditions that would simulate a crisis situation. Things like varied terrain, climbing over debris and rubble, climbing over slash if you're in a forest, perhaps you might have an injury, the whole adrenaline rush of the situation, the anxiety of the situation, you're going to be hungry, dehydrated, fatigued, it's going to be hot, rainy, buggy. If you can't hike your bug out bag for a mile in the perfect conditions laid out by the urban landscape, but thinking you're going to be able to do it on the multi-dimensional landscape of an SHTF scenario is downright delusional. Regular endurance and strength training is absolutely necessary for preparedness. And the truth of the matter is that the average person needs a lot more than they can carry to survive comfortably, even for a week, never mind periods of time that are longer than that. The more you can carry, the more capable you're going to be when you get there. Carrying an ultralight minimalist bug out bag is not going to work for the majority of the population. The reality is you're going to want as much food and water as you can carry in one of these situations. And how much you can carry is going to depend on how fit you are. A lot of these miniaturized survival kits that you see being marketed can only be effectively utilized by people with experience using the tools within them. Good luck snaring an animal with a brass wire in your miniaturized survival kit if you've never done it before. These micro survival kits can be highly empowering to those with the skills to use them. And indeed, even if you don't have experience, it's arguably better than nothing. But many people will be in for a reality check if they ever have to put one of these kits to use because they're not going to know how to use the tools within it. This is why more gear, if you're able to carry it, is always a good thing. While knowledge may weigh nothing, Good gear is a force multiplier for that knowledge and can mean the difference between just barely surviving and thriving. The reality is you're not going to be the only one scavenging for resources. Visions of lone survivors traversing a barren post-apocalyptic wasteland is a common misconception for preppers. 
The truth of the matter is, is that if you are forced to bug out, then you're likely not going to be the only one. You'll have the company of droves of refugees who are fleeing the same thing that you are fleeing, and all of you will be devouring resources along the way, like a swarm of locusts through a farmer's field. There's going to be competition for resources, and thus there will be conflict. This is why if you are thrust into one of these exodus scenarios, that you need to be thinking two steps ahead in terms of the procurement of resources. Check out my many videos on urban scavenging for tips towards this end. The truth is most people in the developed world are simply not built for the wilderness. The majority of people never leave the comfort of their home to travel the world in a hotel, never mind a traveler's hostel. Even fewer still will go camping at a roadside attraction with a motor home or a trailer. And even fewer people will partake in what's now known as rustic camping, aka tent camping. And almost nobody, with the exception of the minuscule fraction of the population that are bushcrafters, are ever going to spend a night in a shelter made of solely natural materials. You may be one of those who harbors the delusion that you are going to be able to rise to the challenge and weather the elements of nature when you are forced to. But the reality is your domesticated body is simply not built for the stress of the natural world. While you may in the off chance be able to prolong your life long enough to be rescued, the lifestyle that most people who have no conditioning to the elements are going to lead is going to be one of hardship and abject destitution. The best piece of advice I can provide along this dimension is that you routinely challenge yourself to get out of your comfort zone so when this involuntarily happens to you, you're not going to be in foreign territory and you're going to be able to adapt much faster. The reality is you will not survive indefinitely in the wilderness and most people will not even survive for a short period of time. Even the most seasoned survivalists can barely last a few months in the wilderness before getting rescued, never mind surviving there indefinitely. The reality is there is no escaping civilization. Humans need each other in order to survive. Along with this comes the myth of total self-reliance. In order to establish a homestead initially, you need the tools of civilization to build and thereafter maintain it. The best you can ever hope for is a limited interaction with your hominid counterparts. Post-collapse isolationism is a myth. You need other people and their special skill sets in order to thrive. While it's true that the human body can go six weeks without food, after but 10 days without food, the lethargy, fatigue, and diminished brain function that you'll be afflicted with will turn you into an immobilized zombie who is incapable of procuring food. So even though you'll technically not starve to your end for about six weeks depending on your starting body weight, it's likely that after a week or two, without some external help, especially having someone aid you in the refeeding process, which is not as simple as just stuffing your face, you likely are not going to make it. So don't bank on not being able to eat for five weeks at a time. Most people aren't going to last even a couple days without water and still be mentally sound. Just like in the case of food, the body is going to become largely incapacitated long before it's deceased. While the body may technically last several days without water, after just a couple days in mild conditions, most people aren't going to be able to move without cramping up. Remember that your brain is three quarters water, and without it, you're not going to be able to think properly. You're going to have cognitive impairment, you're going to be temperamental, and you're going to be making mistakes. You're losing two to three liters of water per day in the best of conditions from basic bodily processes. Just like in the case of food, you will lose the physiological wherewithal in order to procure water long before you die of dehydration. The reality is combat is so multidimensional that to think you're going to survive it without any combat experience is foolish. The best thing you can do in most cases is try to avoid a fight at all costs. All it takes is but one round to lay to rest your run and gun fantasies. Even the most seasoned veterans of the sport can be caught off guard in the first skirmish, never mind having to battle over and over again, which could be a reality in a situation where the justice system was not functioning. Getting that form of training now can help you hardwire the motor skills that are going to be required for you to come out of one of these situations without sustaining casualties. The reality is there are going to be consequences for your actions after SHTF. The absence of rule of law, in fact, may have the unexpected effect of making things even more difficult for criminals. When the populace, local governments, 
communities are forced to take matters into their own hands. They are likely going to do so without the fear of recourse from the authorities and punishment is going to be administered in real time swiftly and disproportionately. These punishments are going to be much harsher than those upheld by the current justice system. And just remember that everybody you cross has family members and friends. And the last thing you want to do in a crisis is to make enemies in a lawless environment. Post-collapse anarchy would not be a free-for-all. Justice is bound to be enforced in some way or another, even if it's only on a street-by-street -street basis with communities policing themselves. The families of your enemies are going to seek retribution. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Avoid these entanglements at all costs. And if you are on the other end of trying to discipline these deviants, do so diligently and to the best of your capabilities, try to make the punishment fit the crime. What are some common misconceptions and delusions that you frequently come across in the preparedness community? Let us know in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe and try to live within the moment in those few moments that you have with your families throughout the day. Thanks for watching Canadian Prepper Out. The best way to support this YouTube channel is to support yourself by gearing up through CanadianPreparedness.com or BugOutRoll.ca. Premium quality gear at the best possible price using the incredibly secure and easy to use Shopify platform. We offer free shipping to the United States for orders over $200 USD and free shipping to Canada over $75. So support the channel by supporting yourself.